you all had a dream of equality for women. Yes. You had a strategy. You knew you had to dismantle the laws and rebuild the laws. Yes. And you knew that you needed power. Yes. So you were trying to get women in parliament and in positions where they could lead. And so that effort, the other peak component I want you to talk about is standing up and speaking out because I know you were president of FIDA at one time and you used that platform to speak out. So talk about that, why it's so important to have a voice that is reasoned, that is thoughtful, that has done homework, but you had the courage to speak out. How did you do that and where did you find that courage? Uh, the courage came because I believed completely in the vision and the mission of FIDA to outdraw discrimination and bring respect for both women and we call it gender justice. I believed totally in that respect for human rights for everybody. And therefore, when we spoke out to say we must hand FGM because it brings down the girl child. It encourages early child marriage. This is a girl who is just nipped in the band, married off. She doesn't even know who she is. Then she will start having children, a child herself, early marriages. And then also sexual harassment defilement and rapes a lot of cases of sexual gender-based violence, where we witnessed even people in power and people in authority um, raping children, you know, because it's culture. We were told it's culture. When a man goes and takes a 15-year-old girl, makes her pregnant, uh, because we had cases like those and they are documented in FIDA where people in authority, cabinet ministers, and taken a girl and impregnated her. And medical evidence showed that this is a child. And when we stood up and said, this is rape, police, you've got to investigate. You've got to charge him with a criminal offense. Everybody wondered what is wrong with these women. We said this is violation of a child and we instituted private prosecution against mm -hmm. the cabinet minister. Uh, of course, the DPP, the director of public prosecutions then came and withdrew the case. It was a minister's case, but not before we were called all manner of names mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, but we stood firm that uh, this is uh, what we believe in as FIDA, protection of the rights of the vulnerable, protection of the rights of the girls. And therefore, when a girl comes complaining to us, we have to take that complaint seriously. Take it to the police. And if the police do not do anything, we institute private prosecution. It's provided for in the law. And then I know one of the things FIDA used to do was accompany victims to the police station, yes. meet with the prosecutors, try to get a prosecution going. Yes. And so that was also part of what FIDA did. Now, at some point, you decided to change from being an advocate to a judge. So explain how it is why you chose a judiciary and how it is you got that first position on the high court. We worked very hard to promote the rights of women, to promote women in leadership, advocated very, very seriously that uh, we needed women in decision making. Needed, women needed to sit in tables where decisions affecting them are being made. And then when it came to the change of government in 2002, everybody thought I should go into politics. And they were asking me whether I want to be nominated. And I wasn't quite interested in, uh, 
politics. And then I was asked whether I want to become a judge. Uh, I have never thought myself as a judge because I've been an advocate and I've been an activist asking for the rights and I thought I should probably end the Kenya Human Rights Commission as the chair. But uh, when I was called by the Chief Justice Gishero and asked, uh, you know, my name has been nominated by the Judicial Service Commission having been forwarded by the Royal Society as one of the people to be appointed a judge in 2002 when the government changed from the Moi era to the Kibaki era, I said, let me go home and think about it. And when I went home, uh, the next day I came back and I said, I will take it. Because I knew I was going to make an impact. I've been standing in those corridors of justice, asking for orders uh, to protect my clients, uh, my clients, you know, and I said, this is an opportunity for me now uh, to actually become, to enter into decision making and make those changes that I've been asking for. Changes that will protect our families from violence, changes that will protect and bring equality in our society, in the way we treat one another, we treat one another with dignity. So the only thing I asked Chief Justice Gishero was whether he could um, send me, uh, deploy me in the family division. And he said, yes, in fact, there's a lot of backlog of cases there, I'll send you to the family division. And so in 2003, in May, I was the, in the, within the first bunch of judges who were appointed, who were eight of us, uh, three women and five men who were appointed by Kibaki, uh, the third president. And I was sent to the family division where I was for three years. And I was most privileged uh, to have been instrumental in coming up with a checklist that um, enabled people to quickly file uh, succession matters and uh, give timelines within which we could process those uh, uh, succession matters. And we finished a lot of uh, backlog of cases of succession and also family matters, uh, you know, divorce and custody of children um, moved very, very quickly. Uh, after three years in the family division, I was sent to Nakuru, where I was uh, the resident judge in charge of the station. Nakuru then was a huge jurisdiction because there was no high court in Naivasha, Nyaururu, um, Kericho, all that area was Nakuru law court. Um, and I, and I, just let me stop you there because I remember when you took that assignment and there was tremendous backlog. Yes. Yes. And yes. you took some steps to really clean up the backlog. Share a couple of those steps with us. Yes. I really enjoyed my time in uh, Nakuru uh, because when you are a resident judge, you are allowed to think and innovate and see how best you can run the station. We were three judges, myself, Justice Musinga, who is the president of the Court of Appeal, and Justice Kimaru. Uh, the first thing we did was to establish the case backlog which never used to happen. Data was a big problem then. Nakuru is the first station to start identifying the backlog by counting the files physically. And it was not easy to get the cooperation by the staff that we needed to count the files so that we can know how to deal with them. The other thing we did was to innovate and start collaboration with the stakeholders. We called them group. court users committees. Mm -hmm. 
That is where they were born. Now they are in the law. They are the National Council of the Administration of Justice. It started in Nakuru uh, when I was the resident judge. Because we realized that unless we are in agreement with the stakeholders on how we proceed with these reforms, we will get nowhere. Uh, first of all, we were concerned about the criminal justice system, which really was slowing down almost to a halt. And we realized it's because uh, you fix the cases, criminal cases, then witnesses do not show up. Or the day they show up, they show up so many of them that you can't finish, you, you have to adjourn, and when they go away, they probably will not come back again. Or the police will do poor investigations. You are doing so many cases, but the conviction is so low. And yet, crime is, uh, it's, it's large. I mean, we get reports that uh, there is a lot of uh, crime going on. So uh, that's why, why we started. First of all, called the police and the prosecution. We sat down, we said, these cases, 80% of them are acquittals. Why would we spend all our time? So we went through, we started even pre-bargaining in Nakuru. It's there in the law, but um, even when it took root, I was the one called to go and speak to the prosecutors how pre-bargaining can work. I remember giving a keynote speak, speech to uh, prosecutors. I think it was your training, actually. It was. It was, it was your training. Because we, because from the beginning, yes. we always talked about plea bargaining. Plea bargaining. And your voice yes. was a voice yes. that really helped move things forward yes. in Kenya on plea bargaining. On plea bargaining. Yes. So Nakuru is was a place where I was able to discover my leadership skills in terms of uh, uh, getting the station to work that we needed to, first of all, establish the backlog of cases. We needed to explain what we are doing to the lawyers. The lawyers were used to just filing applications. You file a case, you file with an application seeking interim orders. Once you get interim orders, you forget the trial of the matter. So in Akuru, we agreed with the lawyers that let's give time to the substantive matter. Instead of spending time to hear an application, you spend time to go and write a ruling. Just put your witness on the witness box. Let me hear what they are saying because the law had then changed the rules and changed to allow people to follow the evidence. When you are filing your pleadings, you file your witness statements and uh, you file your documents because everything is in the file. It's easier for your witness to get into the witness box. I hear everything. Instead of writing a ruling, I write a judgment. And that way we were able to clear a lot of backlog because we killed interlocutory mm -hmm. applications. Which has been a great barrier here in this system. It is. Up to there today. are no limits on filing those oh. interim or and it just and then people take them up to the Court of Appeal yes. and it slows the entire process Absolutely. down. Absolutely. And your user group, just so it's clear for everyone, it was not just the police and the prosecutors. It was the prison officials. Yes. It was the bar association. Yes. It was civil society organizations. Yes. The for children, yes. and the indigent, and you and business. There was a business representation, yes. so that the entire community could focus on the justice, the system justice system, and what each could do. Yes. So you you then left that assignment, that very successful assignment, and that was when you went to the court of appeals, or did you you had one other uh, stop after, in the high court after Nakuru. I had a small stint at uh, Mirimani Commercial Court. And then after only 16 months, there was trouble in Kitare. Uh, the lawyers were on a gross law for one year. Nothing was happening in that court. I was sent there. And I thought, this is the end of me now. 
but I had the best of my time in Kitale mm. because I discovered that people are traveling for many, many miles to come to court from Rokichogyo, Turkana, the whole of the north to come to court in Kitale. So we started the mobile courts in Kakuma, mm -hmm. in Rokicha, um, and even there I went with the same style of organization. First of all, reduce the prison uh, population uh, by first of all revising the sentences. If you have been sentenced for three years, you have served for like nine months, you are good. You can do community service. I, I reduced the prison uh, population by revising the sentences. There were so many murder cases also, but there were really not murder, there were manslaughter. So I called the prosecutor, I said, I've read these files, almost half of them, they are manslaughter, plea bargaining. We did them. Within a year, I'd put the station back to order and started mobile courts in Kakuma. And that mobile court means that you moved with a couple court staff yes. and you could hold court so people wouldn't have to tra uh, travel so many kilometers, which yes. has been a barrier to yes. trials. And one other thing before we move on to and talk a little more about the a Court of Appeals was the juvenile, you were always concerned about children and the fact that children would languish in jail with adults. Yes. Sometimes in jail, just like adults, longer than what their possible sentence might be and without representation. And so you started that experiment where you brought, you trained judges, prosecutors, and defense counsel. You got defense counsel for the children and started that plea bargaining project yes. that is now spread to every court. Every. Could you just spend, explain that? Yes, and that, that is was so uh, an innovation in Nakuru mm -hmm. uh, where we partnered with the Law Society. We call it the Lift Valley Law Society, that they were interested in giving back to the society. So the only way you can, give, they said they want to give away, to, to give to the society, is by representing children. So they organized themselves. And we got some friends from the UK, the Newcastle Bar Association, that came and supported them to set up a legal aid clinic for children, such that every child who came to court was represented. Uh, they called it the Rift Valley Juvenile um, um, uh, Pro Bono Clinic. And I had a wonderful magistrate who is now a judge, uh, the Honorable uh, Justice Teresia Mateka. She was a magistrate then in charge of the children. And we did a wonderful job with the Rift Valley Law Society representing the children. In fact, that model is what informed the legal aid uh, law that we have and the, the legal aid uh, programs that we have now. Um, it's, it's informed by the Lift Valley Law Society uh, because you realize children are really vulnerable and when they have to come to court, especially when they are in conflict with the law and they have to defend themselves, it's, 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 it's something you don't want even to witness because the child is broken up. Some of these children, because our law, the threshold, the criminal responsibility is very low, are very young. They don't even know themselves, leave alone what they have done, which is wrong. Uh, so that is where my interest for child justice started when I was in Nakuru. And everywhere I went in the prisons, we agreed that if they spot a child, they make an application for revision straight away for me to make an order releasing that child from the prison. Now it's a practice all over the prisons. Should there be a mistake that a child has been convicted or has been remanded in the adult prison, the matter will be brought the next day to the judge for revision of that, that order.
And so that was not only protecting the child, which was so crucial, but the impact on families. On because family, the parents yeah. desperate to have some kind of representation. The other thing that I know you did was change the attitude of the judiciary about these cases when we talk about plea bargaining. Yes. Because instead of feeling, well, someone pleads guilty, they can get the same sentence they would get if they went to trial. Mm -hmm. There had to be a change in the attitude in the judiciary as well. So I understand, too, that the judiciary worked on what would be decent sentences you know that would that would help the child reform that would but would be fair yes and also bringing the family into uh, into the whole setup because we had to explain that um, a child requires protection the child requires support and when you see a child who is in conflict with the law or even in contact with the law, it's because of a failure of a system. And we have to take responsibility. We adults, we who are responsible for the child. Therefore, there is no way we are going to process the child alone. We will require the parents to come to the table and find a solution because now it becomes a problem. And pre-bargaining, was actually tested um, in the children cases mm -hmm. because it, it, it was happening a lot in manda trials. Manda trials, we always apply, apply in the pre-bargaining. But these other crimes, there was resistance because when you talk to colleagues, they would say, even the prosecutors, they would say, or the community will say that there has been compromise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but we kept on saying our life is about bargaining. Even when you go to the market, you bargain. Life is about bargaining. So if I've been charged with an offense and I can save court time, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to keep coming to court. Uh, judge will also save their judicial time if I pleaded guilty and then um, I'm sentenced and I've left the system, it is much better. So it was, it was an appeal task to get um, the idea bought that uh, pre-bargaining is actually provided in our law but we are not utilizing it. It's the high time we utilized it. It is cost effective, both for the court and also for the prosecution and also for the, for the accused person. Plus, one of the things that was critical in the plea bargaining process was transparency. So that when someone pleads guilty to the entire courtroom, to the community, there is an understanding as to exactly what they've bargained to. They have to admit their guilt. You know, all the extenuating circumstances and everything comes out. So you have a record that the community can see so people can see it is fair and it has not been improper compromise. Mm -hmm. You're right, and especially the, the pre-bargaining agreement it's, it's there for everybody to see how the proceedings were conducted and what, what happened. So we've come a long way. And thank you so much because you did a lot of training to, um, there used to be tripartite, the advocates, the prosecutors, and even judges present and magistrates present to, to understand how, we, and even the comparative experiences from the U.S. were absolutely helpful. So we have to keep scaling that up because I keep saying now, even as the Chief Justice, this is our society. Whatever is not happening properly, the things we need to fix, it is for us to fix. Uh, even sending people to jail is really not the solution because at the end of the day, they are our people. So 
uh, if there is a halfway, they can reform and understand their wrongdoing and they contribute better even when they are not serving inside prison but outside doing some community service, it's better for us. So this is why we are now even talking about the green justice, whereby instead of sentencing, uh, especially we have very many young men, mm -hmm. young people who are being sentenced, instead of sending them to prison to be fed, it's better for them to do community service. They plant trees, they clean the environment, and we green our spaces uh, using that uh, well, well, much resource. Like, yeah, much like Rwanda, yes. as Rwanda has done, for yes. people who participated in the genocide and yes. then admitted it, and now they're helping to build the community. I want to talk about one other thing, because I know we're going to get to CJ, how you became CJ, but a lot of these initiatives we've talked about are things you're implementing now as the Chief Justice. Yes, I am. And one of the issues of this you mentioned uh, when with the Children's Project, it was the Bar Association and lawyers were doing it pro bono, mm -hmm. offering their time free. Mm -hmm. I know this is also important to you because yes. We couldn't function in the U.S. if we didn't have lawyers donating their time mm -hmm. to represent the voiceless, mm -hmm. from children to mm -hmm. the homeless to all these other categories. And I know that's something near and dear to your heart, encouraging the Bar Association to donate their time. Yes, and we have to scale that, uh, Judge Williams, to the level maybe where the U.S. is. Uh, by working with the law society to make sure that uh, there are incentives like um, when you give uh, your time on pro bono to represent the vulnerable, then you can be given some, uh, say, points so that you don't have to do the, uh, the continuous CLE. education that they require of you to do certain hours of uh, continuous education. Uh, so, but by and by, uh, especially out of Nairobi, I see there is a lot of sign-in by the lawyers to give back to the community, and they find it easier to do, to, to, to represent children. Uh, but we also have, um, a huge segment of our criminal justice who are unrepresented. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I had to make an executive um, pronouncement as the Chief Justice to say all those who are charged with capital offenses like robbery with violence and the sentence is death like Manda. Manda we provide legal aid but we don't provide mm -hmm. legal aid for robbery with violence, to include them also. Um, but we will get resources uh, because I think resources follow good programs. Uh, so we have to keep talking to our colleagues in the legal profession to really believe in giving. Because once you give, you also receive. Um, those of us who are people of faith, we believe in giving and also receiving. Uh, you receive more than you give. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And so you, then the Court of Appeals was quite an appointment for you because even when you went on the Court of Appeals, there were not lots of women on the Court of Appeals. Yes. We were the first. Uh, we were the first women because by the time we got to the Court of Appeal, uh, the Lady Justice F.A. War had left. She had retired, and uh, Justice Aruoch had gone to the, the ICC. Mm -hmm. So we were the first women. Uh, it used to be a bench of men, all of them, 12 of our men. Uh, we came in at a go. Uh, I think we were five women who came at a go. And uh, now we are half half. Uh, half men, half women in the Court of Appeal. Uh, the Court of Appeal is where I felt that I needed to do something more for children uh, because 
now it's in the court of appeal you just did with appeals mm -hmm. you are not in the trial so you are not likely to meet the very vulnerable except those who come and um, there were very few but in the corridors of justice you will find children and when you look around i felt we needed to do something so i would always go out for the child to make sure that uh, I've called the magistrate or I've called the deputy registrar. And then Chief Justice Mutunga actually realized I had an interest for children. He appointed me as the chair of the special task for some children matters. Uh, it uh, was a multi-sectoral um, task force with everybody, the police, the prosecution, the law society, the prisons, uh, the children department, everybody who has something to do with the children in the justice sector, we were there. And we were given 16 terms of reference, which we reduced into three thematic areas that we needed to look at the laws. I begin with the law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the Children Act uh, was problematic, so we started uh, reviewing it for reforms. And it has taken us 10 years. It just passed last week. Um, then we did all the rules, regulations, practice notes, guidelines, policies, everything about children is right. Then we looked at the institutions, the infrastructure uh, that supports children and also made recommendations on what needed to be done for the Boston institution, for the rehab schools, for the uh, child um, charitable institutions that uh, take children, including the, the private ones. Uh, so all the reforms are in place for children. Now what is required is takeoff implementation. Mm -hmm. And we have renewed, I have now renewed that uh, task force uh, for them now to focus on the implementation because the law is in place, policies in place, rules are in place, guidelines are in place, it's only implementation. So we hope if the implementation is done, our children will be safe because so, it, it is a comprehensive one that requires we work with the families, we work with the communities, we work with a unit called uh, Yumba Kumi, Every Nyumbakumi should be able to know how many children are in that uh, setup. Are these children going to school? Are they well adjusted or they are, you know, smoking and drinking? And what can be done? Activities within the communities that support children. Yes. And it's so a very exciting time for. Very exciting. Very <laughs> exciting. And you yes. have been an incredible game changer at each phase of your career. And yes. then the application to be the CJ. Yes, that came when uh, Chief Justice David Maraga, the immediate uh, former Chief Justice retired. And the advertisement was made, I think in January, uh, it was uh, in January, uh, 2020. Uh, so I applied. And the reason why I applied is we met as women judges, uh, senior women judges. Uh, and at one point you had been president of the magistrate and judges association. Yes, I have been. And, and I know you were very active in the International Association of Women, women judges, judges. And yes. the women judges group yeah, in here Kenya. in Kenya. Yes. Yes, I've been the president of the Kenya Magistrates and Judges Association. Even when I practiced law, I was, um, apart from being the chair of FINDA, I was also in the Law Society. And I was the treasurer and the founder of the East Africa Law Society. I've served at the African Committee on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, uh, speaking about policy and the laws for children in the entire of Africa. Uh, how can we domesticate the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of Child? So I've made interventions from the Africa level to see how we can influence every country, the 54 countries, to uh, adopt the charter 
and domesticate it and uh, put in mechanisms to protect children in the whole of Africa. And I know So you're... I've been working at FINDA, you know, we made presentations at the UN on the situation of women. We were in the delegations that went to the CSW, the Commission on the Status of Women, nearly every year to advocate for inclusion of women, non-discrimination, and really to see how we can engender equality in everything that we do. So, um, And then with the UN, I know you were like runner-up in 2020, first runner-up for UN Kenyan's Person of the Year Award for yes. that of work that you did trying to bring the Af African countries into the fold. I also know you're a big supporter of the effort Sealy is making for this African Judicial Network. Yes. To bring all the countries so that there will be a vehicle, because there's a Chief Judges Association. Yes. yes. And the East African Chief Judges yes. meet and the various Chief Judges. And there's the International Association of Women Judges. And that, but that network is a little different because it will help to share best practices of each country and build a connection with the judges, especially the judges on the ground. Yes. So your work continues to inspire judges being brought together. So you decided to apply, and I and I know you mentioned your husband uh, when you had when you said yes that first time. You thought about it overnight. I know that was a discussion you had with him, yes. and that he's been supportive of you throughout. So what advice do you have to men and women on how you juggle? This uh, career as successful as yours, or any career that people you, you're, you're moving forward, and also have a family. My husband, I think, is the greatest. He's one of my greatest fans. Uh, he supports me wholeheartedly. Uh, he is able to step in in the family to release me to go and concentrate with my work, and that has been. The arrangements, even early in our marriage, even when the children were small. Uh, but the children, I brought them up, taking them to the office to see exactly what I do there. And sometimes when I'm called by my clients and it is Saturday, I have nobody to leave the children with. I put them in the car and I'm driving. <laughs> my client has been taken to the police station. <laughs> <laughs> and and children, you take the children to the police station with you. I take yeah. them to the police station and I tell them, uh, Rebecca's mom has, is in the police station. And they're like, oh, Rebecca's dad has taken them to the police station. I say, yes, we have to remove them. So I've had a very supportive husband. So when it came to the position of the chief justice, uh, we sat with the senior women judges and all of them said they were not applying including the Deputy Chief Justice, including the Judge of the Supreme Court, the Honorable Lady Justice Joe Kindomo. And all my colleagues in the, in the Court of Appeal, they said they are not applying. Why? They do not want to go through that process. It is so tedious, it's so, it will bring indignity to them. It is a process that nobody thinks it's worth it. And I listened and I said, because nobody is applying, I will apply. Because I want to make a statement to our girl child, to the generations to come, that we were there and nobody applied. What explanation shall we give? I said, for that reason, I will apply because when I look at my experience that spans from working here in Kenya as a lawyer for 34 years, working in the region, working internationally, working in the whole continent, I will bring it to the table. So, but I still didn't feel the energy. Mm -hmm. I wanted, but the energy was low. I had very low energy to apply. Um, I kept on saying I will apply, I will apply, until almost the last day, that's when I took my application. Um, but my family was very supportive. My husband was like, have you applied? 
<laughs> I will apply tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, have you applied? <laughs> applied <the notes. laughs> Until my daughter started writing for me the CV, <laughs> saying, look, mom, what do you need? I said, I need to revise my CV, it's done. And she's, you know, but the day I sat down to write that application, I felt that I have to defend this application. I have to do my best. I started preparing myself and I asked for leave for two weeks to prepare. I never looked back. I wrote a whole strategy mm -hmm. of what I'm going to do if I am Chief Justice. And in my preparations, I was saying, when I'm Chief Justice, not if, it is when, because I wrote the strategy, this vision of where I see the judiciary as Chief Justice Martha Combe. And it was a wonderful journey, even though the interview was tough because I had to do two interviews by the Judicial Service Commission. It was a whole six hour interview. In, in public, in on public, TV, oh, yeah, because I saw it this from, I watched you in Chicago. On these cameras. Right. Yes, six hours. And then when I was nominated, I also had to be vetted by the National Assembly. So I also appeared in Parliament for another growing exercise. It wasn't as long. That was, was like two hours. Uh, so it, it is not easy. You have to prepare yourself psychologically, physically, spiritually. You have to believe in yourself and you have to show what it is that you have done over the last 30 years to impact on the society positively, to show that you are able actually to provide the leadership uh, because you have done it. As a woman, the expectations are more than when it is a man. And even the questions that you will have to answer are more than the men will be asked. Because one of the questions I was asked is, why do you hate men? I said, I love men because I've lived with one for the last 34 years, more than uh, almost 40 years now. <laughs> 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 and I'm a mother of also a boy. I cannot hate men. I love men. It's only that I ask that they do not, I mean, they respect women. Um, they, we respect one another. We want a society where we treat each other with uh, respect and dignity.